OK, so that's the recording and the transcription started. As ever, these will be transcoded and uploaded to our YouTube channel uh, as soon as I can, probably early next week. OK, we had been talking about um, techniques that we can use to investigate, techniques that we can use to talk to people in business and how we record those results. Because there's no point in doing these things. There's no point in talking to people and trying to understand the business processes and trying to understand the people and what they're up to. There is no point in doing that if you don't write it down somewhere. So these techniques are both ways to approach it and ways to document it. So we had spoken last week about a few of those, PESOL, MOST, Resource Audit, Boston Box, and we're going to continue on with that this week. So as ever, if you have questions, don't hesitate, give me a shout and just stop me on the way through. First one we're looking at today is something called a SWOT analysis, which is possibly the most famous one that, you, that we've, we've covered. Um, it's used in all sorts of places and all sorts of areas to try to understand where any sort of organisation is. So SWOT is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And it comes after we've done these other things that I've spoken about. There was a reason that I gave them in the order that I did. Until you better understand the business, you can't say what its strengths are until you've looked at resource analysis. You can't understand where the weaknesses are because you don't know anything about the business. So once we have looked at all the internal and external factors using our cat wall and our pestle and our Boston box and all that kind of stuff, once we've got a clearer understanding of everything to do with the business, we can start to categorise things. We can start to think about these four headings and where our business lies in each of those. It's good for group work, so it's good to get everybody together and go, well, what do you think? What are we good at? What are we bad at? What should we be doing? But I'll caution you again, as I have before, that there can be an issue in terms of the attendees. Some people may be less willing to speak freely if the boss is sitting there. So you'll sort of see nervous looks. Can I actually say what I think our weakness is? What if the weakness is the boss? So it's nice to get groups, but be careful how you set up the groups. Think about the mix of people there and think about whether they will be encouraged to speak freely or whether they will be impeded in giving uh, an honest appraisal of where they think they are. Similarly, and for the same sort of reasons that I spoke about when we were talking about setting up groups for this module, you need to be careful that people don't just sit back and go, Oh, well, my mate said that, I agree with my mate. Groupthink can be an issue. And spreading things out, perhaps between different sections or between people who wouldn't normally work with each other, can help with that. So get a set of people together, get them to think about these things, and you can start putting them up on a board somewhere. It is important to get strengths. If for no other reason than 
to give people uh, encouragement. Nobody wants to go into a meeting to be told how bad they are. So starting off with strengths lets people think about, oh yeah, well, okay, we're good at this and this, and I'm really pleased that we're doing that. And it gets people into a position of strength so that they can then start to look at the other issues. If they feel as if there's some things that are good, they're more willing to identify things that aren't so good. There's some examples up there, but you as the BSA can no doubt think of many more. And of course, the other thing that you should do in your position is question. If someone says, oh, this part of the business is fantastic, and your investigations have found out that this part of the business has seen declining sales year on year for the past five years, it's your job to challenge that and say, why do you think that when the empirical evidence says this? So even if the organisation feel that something is a strength, if there's evidence that it isn't, you're there to challenge it. And similarly for things that are weaknesses, once they have identified their strengths, they are more likely to look at weaknesses and be more honest about identifying those weaknesses. And again, there's some suggestions up there, but I'm sure you can think of many more. And again, that becomes an issue if we um, come up against problems that people are unwilling to identify. I don't know if you've been keeping up with the case study questions and answers, but there was one today pointing out that the spreadsheets were in euros. Clearly a weakness of this organisation is that those creating the spreadsheets don't understand how to do a spreadsheet and may or may not know the difference between different currencies. But depending on who's created that spreadsheet, people may not be so willing to point that out. So strengths, weaknesses, and then places where staff think we can make a change and make a positive change to make the business better. What are the opportunities? Oh, I've heard that there's going to be a music festival. Shouldn't we have an ad on that music festival site offering uh, a weekend bed and breakfast deal? Oh, I have heard that um, they're considering building a new bypass. What will that do to the business? Will it bring more people to us? Oh, I've heard there's this newfangled thing called Facebook. Should we be on there? What are the opportunities that the organisation has? Are there things that they can do to make the business better, to make the sales better, to do whatever is required to make that happen? And the flip side to that, the other side of the coin is, what are the threats? And, and in your case study, I don't think I'm giving away too much to point out that a new hotel being built fairly close to your, your hotel is a threat. So again, there's some examples up there, but you'll be able to think of lots more. And what happens when you get that is you end up with something like this. You get a SWOT analysis for an organisation. Now this is deliberately quite an old one. Even when I started, this was an old one. You'll see it's talking about a whole bunch of things that um, don't even exist anymore for Google. Um, and the reason it's deliberately an old one is to point out that these analyses may or may not always work out well. 
a strength of Google, Picasa, G+, and Google Music. Uh, none of those exist anymore. A weakness, 96% of income from online advertising. Well, yeah, it is a weakness and you want to do the diversify revenue, but Alphabet and Google Wars is now is part of the Alphabet group. Uh, their revenue went up and they made 40 billion from online advertising. So, you know, I could cope with that kind of weakness. It is good to try and diversify, but it's nice to bring in stuff. Opportunities increased penetration into Chinese market. Yeah, massive. Except if the Chinese government say that there are some things that you can't find on a Google search, that then becomes a threat because um, other people see that Google changed their results for different areas and see that as somehow cheating. So this is a good analysis, but it may or may not last. I too miss Google Music. One of the first things I did was uh, digitize my CD collection and uploaded it to Google Music, because one of the things that it was let you have unlimited. And it was great. It was available everywhere. You could download it if you weren't going to be close to a, a connection. So if you were on the phone, whatever, it was fantastic. Best music service out there. So what did they do? They closed it, put it onto YouTube Music, which is awful. But they did it because every time I go into YouTube Music, all I ever see is an ad saying, would you like to take out a family plan? No, go away. I'm not giving you money. Similarly, um, and this is where business judgments come in. I was a big fan of Google Photos. I still am a big fan of Google Photos. And I uploaded all my photos to Google. And because, again, they let you upload as many as you wanted. And as part of that, I felt, I felt good about what Google were doing. So I didn't mind when Google would send me notifications saying, oh, judging from the information you've uploaded for this photo, it's been taken at Disneyland. Would you like to add your photo so people can see what Thunder Mountain looks like from your photo? And I said, yeah, OK. If As long as it didn't have you know, my family in it, if as long as it was just like scenery or something, yeah, upload it. And then it means that if you're using Street View or any of the other services, people get the advantage. And I didn't mind because I'd already taken the photo and all I had to do is click and say, yeah, that's fine. But I've stopped doing it. And part of the reason I've stopped doing it is because Google now charged me to upload my photos. So what they're saying is, I'm going to charge you to store this photo, but would you mind if I used it for free in all my other services? And my answer now is, that'll be right. So trying to diversify can cause unexpected outcomes which is a long way around saying none of these things are guaranteed. Any questions? Nope. Okay. In that case, I want to end not with specific techniques, but with, with general principles. And actually, this is something that you'll be doing uh, this term in research methods. You'll be talking about uh, different ways of doing research, specifically qualitative and quantitative research. So You'll do a lot more in there, so this is just a, a quick overview. It's talking about the different uh, types 
So qualitative is... I imagine that's Google phoning me up to tell me that I can't say that about them. My apologies, I must have forgot. Yet again, I've forgotten to put it on mute, which I have done now. Um, yeah, so qualitative is a way of trying to understand what people feel. Now, that's always tricky. It's not, if you ask someone how they feel, you'll get a variety of answers. Happy, sad, upset, ecstatic. How do you capture that kind of response? How do you say and have any certainty that that actually is how someone's feeling? And even if it is, is that how they're going to be feeling in five minutes or half an hour or an hour? So qualitative is um, how long is a piece of string type stuff. So it's helpful, it's necessary, it's useful, but it, and this might just be me, I am far happier looking at a bunch of numbers and trying to infer from actual data. So actual quantitative data. How much was sold today versus how much was sold yesterday? I can look at that and say it's gone up or down. And the answer's true. I can work it out. Qualitative is not so precise. It's still useful though. And as I say, I'm, I'm trying very much not to let my own biases get in the way of this because I'm, I'm well aware that I'm more comfortable with, with, with numbers, with data than I am with, the, with this kind of side, with people's opinions type side and how much weight you give to those opinions. So with that caveat, let's look at some techniques for performing qualitative analysis with your groups. Now, when we're doing this, it is about understanding the business processes. What do you do when? What happens if someone comes into the restaurant? Who gets involved? Who goes to serve them? Who decides what, who takes the menu? Who decides uh, who brings the wine list? How does the order get to the kitchen? How does the order get from the kitchen back to the table? Who decides when to clear the table? Who takes the bill? You know, whatever it happens to be, it all helps in trying to understand how the business works. The subtext for you though, is trying to understand the people themselves. Might they want to change things? Which is helpful for you because that's what you're going to do. And if they do want to change things, do they have particular things that they would want to change and things that they would be keen to see happen? So that's always uh, a subtext for you in terms of how you approach this. Sorry, could you excuse me just for a second? My apologies. OK, so we will look at some techniques. Um, at least we will when PowerPoint advances. Come on, PowerPoint, you can do it. Yay. So we'll look at interviews, workshops and observations. So interviews can be one to one or they can be with 
uh, groups of people. So you may interview a waiter or you may interview all the waiters. It's entirely up to you. Um, and the caveats I, I gave you before in terms of groupthink and in terms of people deferring to others um, all apply here. Regardless, what you're going to have to do is not just rock up and hope for the best. You need to think about what the interview is about. You need to plan for it. You need to prepare. You don't, for example, go in and speak to taking an example purely at random, an accountant with 40 years experience without having read the documents because they make upset. I don't know why I've thought of that one. I don't know where that came from, but it's just a. So you need to prepare. You need to make sure that you've got all the information you possibly can and understand everything about that. Then you do the interview and then you follow up. So, as I say, it's usually one to one. It can be more, but usually. Given that they are one to one and given that these take a, a reasonable amount of time. Unless you get so scared by your interviewee that you clam up. You need to think about who you're going to interview and you've been doing that recently. You've been looking at your case study and I hope the people that you've been choosing are people that you think can help you better understand the business. So who do you interview on the basis that you can't interview everybody in the business? And then what should you ask? You should have a list of questions prepared. Don't wing this. And you need to make sure that input comes from everywhere. Last week, you, there was some chat after we, you'd spoken to uh, one of the co-owners that perhaps you should have spoken to the other co-owner as well. It's possible. They might have different views on how the business should progress. But you have to wonder if a couple who have been married for decades and have run a hotel together for decades have a big um, divergence in how they'd approach it. They may have, but we don't know. So you need to decide who you're going to interview. You need to get them from all strata in the organisation um, and not just concentrate on the people that are paying you. And similarly, not just concentrate on the people that it's going to affect. So get them from everywhere, from top to bottom, and make sure that you have an agenda for them. Here's what we're going to do in this interview. That lets your interviewee prepare as well. If they're just coming in cold and you say to them, what do you want to change in the business? I don't know. Um, How would you like us to change your business for you? I don't know. That's why you're here. So have an agenda, send it to them and give them, maybe not questions, but give them an idea of the areas you'll be talking about so that they can be thinking about it as well. Once you're in there, you'll start asking them questions and you should think about the types of questions that you ask and the types of response that they will garner. So there are different types of question. Open questions are prompts for them to speak about anything they want to. Please tell me about X. What do you think about Y? There's no, there's no set range for that. It's just tell me about it just now. That's an open question. A closed question is the opposite. One where it's very specific and you're looking for an outcome to that question. Do billing staff deal only with invoices? To which the answers could be yes or no, they also deal with purchase orders and they also do um, payroll. 
So it gives you a better idea about what people do and why. The third type of question is uh, the optician question. When they're putting those wee glasses on you. Is this better or worse or roughly the same? You can give things that are a limited choice. Would it be better if you had X, Y or Z? So it's different to an open question because you give specific responses. Better, worse or the same. You can have leading questions. Sometimes they can be useful for you in your position. If you want something to happen, you can interview someone and say, would you agree that it would be better to have this process in place? And when they say yes, you write that down and put their name against it and put an asterisk against it so that when they come back later and go, oh, that's a terrible idea. You can say, well, we spoke about it and you said that was great. You can have probing questions. We just said, do billing staff deal only with invoices? And if you've got an answer, if the answer wasn't just yes, you can follow that up. Oh, so they deal with purchase orders. OK, is that individual purchase orders or is that company of purchase orders? Do they do this? as a main part of the task or do they only uh, help out when the people who mainly deal with purchase orders are busy? So you can follow up with these probing things. And as you start to get a clearer idea of what's going on, you can start to put things together. So you've been through and you've looked at the the business and you've seen that they have 300 purchase orders, but they've got 500 delivery notes. In other words, they've delivered 200 more things than were ordered. Now you need to make sure that that's acceptable and why. So if you go into Amazon and order three things, that's one order. But depending on how you set your delivery, you may have one, two or three deliveries. So you want to make sure that you understand how that process works. Is it customer choice? Is it we make things in a factory and it's actually better to deliver them because otherwise they're sitting about the factory floor getting in the way? What is the reason for this? And if they are sitting in the factory floor getting in the way, would it actually be cheaper to build a hut out of the out the back store things in there and then deliver everything in one go. This is the sort of information that you need to get in order to better understand the business processes, in order to better understand what can be done to help the business. OK, so you have the interview, you walk in, you introduce yourself, you talk to them about it, you try and set them, make them comfortable. Some people will be fine, some people will walk in be absolutely no problem, some people will be really scared. There are some people who will go into an interview thinking that they've done something wrong. No matter what you say, they'll just think they've done something wrong and they'll be really scared. So put them at their ease, tell them what it's about, try and help them to understand what it is you're doing um, and make sure that they are okay with it. Then you go through the questions, pre-prepared, ready to go. Although, of course, you may have to ask follow up questions, depending on the answers they give you. And then similarly, at the end, you thank them. You tell them how much it's helped and you tell them what's going to happen next, because there are next steps. So during the interview, talk to them. Make sure they're OK. Take lots of notes. But make sure you tell them that you're taking notes that they are for you. That they won't be shared with a boss, so they don't need to worry about confidentiality or anything. And that after the interview, 
you will give them the notes. You'll check with them that what you've written down is what they meant to say. Because people can get confused in the interview, they can get nervous, they can say things that they didn't mean to. So after it, you distribute them and say, are you okay with this? Is this what you meant to say? So you get the main points that you got out of them. Get all the documentation that may have come up when you've been talking about particular business processes. Explain to them what will happen next with it. And then start thinking about what other questions you're going to have. Because you're going to have follow ups. The one thing you know that is that when you talk to people, it will raise other questions. And please, please don't forget to thank them. Any questions about that part? OK, next one. So usually interviews are one to one. Next one is workshops where we have lots of people. And there's different reasons for having a workshop and you can see some of them up on the screen just now. And some of these will take place at different stages of uh, your work schedule. So to begin with, you try to figure out what it is you're looking at. If you're talking to this to these people in your case study, what is your scope? Are you looking at the whole business? Are you looking at just the hotel? Are you looking at the hotel and the restaurant, but not the coffee shop? Are you looking at everything holistically? What is the scope of your project and what's the reason for you being there? Later on, you might have a workshop to try and understand what's going on. I'll give you an example of that earlier. What happens when someone walks into the restaurant? What are the processes that are involved in getting an order? and getting that order created and getting it out and getting paid. Later on, you might, having found out these things, you might have a better solution. Well, at the moment, somebody takes out a, a big credit card uh, slip in a machine and gets people to sign it. Well, have you ever heard of remote readers? OK, so you might have different reasons for having the workshop. Regardless, you'll set up the workshop in similar ways. Not surprisingly, the first thing you do is plan it. Why are you having the workshop? What are you trying to get out of that? And that will inform who comes. So you need to think about what you're doing who needs to be there, any issues that that might bring up, where you're going to have it, what sort of techniques that you're going to use. Remember, we talked about the techniques before, and we'll talk about some more today, and where you're going to have it. Are you going to have it in the managing director's office with the managing director looking at you, or more importantly, looking at the staff? So why did you say that about me? Yeah, no, maybe not. Maybe you want to get out of the place altogether and go hire a hall somewhere else. Then you conduct a workshop. And it's important to keep on track. People will talk. You'll always have people who will talk. Unfortunately, you'll also also have people that want to talk about anything but what you want to talk about. So make sure you keep people on track. At the other end of the spectrum, you have the people who absolutely definitely positively do not want to talk. But they actually may be the people that have the most insight into what you need. So make sure you get everybody to participate. And as with the interviews, keep a record of what's going on, write stuff down. And actually, in a moment, we're going to talk about different roles because it can be difficult to be to do all of these things at once. And then as with the interview, after you're done, write it up 
send out notes to people, attended and say, this is what I got out of it. Are you happy with this? OK, so you'll have different people in that workshop, the people that are turning up to participants. Um, and you want people who will contribute. As I say, some of the people that you actually want won't always want to contribute, so that's not always possible. What you really need is the people who are knowledgeable, the people that understand it. And then part of your job is going to be to, be to get them to contribute. At some point, you're also going to want people there who can take decisions. You can say, yeah, we are going to move ahead with this. Probably not something you're going to do yourself, though. A workshop is a place where there's so much happening, you might want different people there. So you might have a scribe, someone who just takes notes all the time. They don't get involved in talking, they don't get involved in the discussion, they're just there to take notes because so much is going on. Sometimes you might want more than one of those because you might split up workshops into subgroups and they might help facilitate some of the subgroups. And you'll want a facilitator. So somebody, that's you. That's you at the front who's able to talk to them, who's able to understand whether people are happy, keen to contribute, scared, and be able to bring people out of their shell and get them to talk. So you have to be confident even if you're not. So talking about bringing people out of their shell, there might be some techniques that you can use to just break the ice. People may or may not know each other, so you might want them to introduce themselves. Just go around the room. I'm Fred and I'm in the delivery. Uh, division. I drive a van. If you want to do um, slightly more um, get people moving type things, you might do a fact or fiction. Go through. Tell me something about yourself and you have to decide whether it is fact or fiction. So you get everybody to create that. Um, and you go around asking them. Was that fact? Was it a fiction? And the fact that people are talking about it, the fact that people are having a laugh about it and trying to uh, understand what's going on. That all helps. With with doing that. So people can either, you know, give an outrageous lie in order to get people talking, or they can give a, an unexpected fact. So you go around and you'll get people who will say things like, uh, I don't know, tell me fact or fiction about you. OK, I have. I'm a published author with uh, a book about Sherlock Holmes. Is that fact or is that fiction? might at this point want to ask questions. You might want them to say why. You might want them to do whatever you, whatever you feel is useful. The idea is just to get people to talk. My name is not Arthur Conan Doyle, no. So one person says fact, one person says fiction. Right, come on then, polls up there. Fact or fiction? 
feel free to ask questions. I will answer them. <laughs> you don't think I'd lie? Yeah, you clearly don't know me. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe. Feel free to buy it on Amazon. So they're not all mine, by the way. It's a, it's a compilation. So it just gets people talking. So there's, there's a few of these types of things. Um, what would you take? if you're going to a desert island. And this is a good one because you can put people into groups. Some people will choose some things, some people will choose others, and then you get back together and fight about which one was right. And then there's other techniques where you actually want to get into the meat of what you're doing. There's brainstorming. Everybody in the group. What do you think about this? But as I've said before, some people will say more than others. So you might want to go around the group with and around Robin, get everybody to say what they think. And if people aren't really keen on speaking up, get them to write it down. Stick it on a post-it, put them on a table, and nobody knows who it was. And then once I've done that, you can start to cluster things together. Oh, look, lots of people are talking about this. That's maybe something that we should focus on. So we can do things like um, talking walls. So instead of the post-it, you get, you know, those big display paper things and you just write it up on there. You get people to think what would happen if the business didn't exist. So it's the old, it's the old joke, the guy driving through Ireland saying, can you tell me how to get to Donegal? And the guy hanging over the gate just looks at me and goes, yeah, I wouldn't start from here. You can do that in a business sense. What would you do if you weren't, if you wanted this business, but didn't have all the baggage around you? How would other people do it? What would you do if you were doing the exact opposite? So all of these things can just help to spark discussion and get people thinking. Any questions about that one? No? OK, so the final one then is observation. So it's all very well getting people to tell you about things. But people don't always tell you the truth. Now, that's different to saying that they lie, although some people will. But some people will have a different view of what's going on, uh, which may not dovetail with the truth. So instead of asking them to tell you about things, you instead look at what they're doing. So once you've got all this information, you may have bits that you're not quite sure about. Maybe you can fill in that space by just 
going and looking. Who decides who get who takes out the bill? Oh, uh, oh, I don't know. It just happens. So you go and you stand in the restaurant and you look. Is it whoever's free? Is it the person that served them before? Is it the manager? And as I say, this isn't always about people lying. This is about people having a different idea about what goes on than what actually does. Because people sometimes aren't actually that good at describing what they do. Partly because some of the things they do to them are just so clear that it doesn't need dis describing. Have you ever been in a car? Have you ever driven a car, driven home, and then realise that you have no recollection whatsoever of how you got there? You don't remember driving the car, you don't remember the route you take, you just ended up at home. Because you didn't have to think about turning the wheel or pressing the pedals or even the route that you were taking because you've done it so often. It was so obvious it didn't imprint itself in your brain. And that can happen at work as well. There are some things that are so obvious that they, you don't tell other people about them. So if you've decided to do this, there's ways that you can do it. You can just look. You can just kind of turn up and see what happens. And that's helpful for kind of smaller pieces of information. You can formalise it. You can say, look, I'm going to come and I'm going to be with you for the morning and I'm just going to come around with you and see what you do and, and take notes. Now, not surprisingly, some people will be a bit perturbed at that thought. So you need to be really careful about how you present that and how you do it. There's something called protocol analysis. So you've worked out how something happens. You then go through it and the staff can say, well, uh, yeah, yes, no, whatever. And there's structured observation. I am going to follow uh, an order from the second it gets to the business to the second that it's paid for and finished. What are all these steps? Now, this can cause a problem. The Heisenberg principle is the idea that simply by observing something, you change what happens. Not surprisingly, if you're watching people do things, they tend to do it slightly differently. I'm well aware that in giving this lecture, I'm recording it and I'm going to put it on YouTube. I'm making far fewer bad jokes than I normally would because I know they're going to be preserved forever. But also because I've only got one person's face to understand whether the bad jokes are working. I'll use bad jokes just to get people, just to see if people are listening or understand if um, what sort of stuff that they react to. Doing this online, that's no good whatsoever. I have no idea what you're doing. I have no idea what your faces are like when I say something. <laughs> you haven't seen the bad jokes, James. It might be a net positive. Well, actually, you probably did. You probably got them first year before all, before all this happened. <laughs> okay, so you can change things. The other thing you can do is change the normal way of running. Because they've got to accommodate you, they might not do it the way they normally do. And part of that is because they're doing something and you're saying, oh, so what are you doing now? And why are you doing that? And that stops them doing what they're supposed to do. You also might have the issue that you're following somebody and what they are doing may bear no relation to what they would normally do. It's an atypical day in that they are doing, I don't know, they're following up a, they're following up a, 
up a complaint that someone had, which they wouldn't normally do. Or um, they are supervising bringing in a new set of table and chairs, which they wouldn't normally do. That doesn't happen that often, but you just happen to arrive in the day that that's happening. So you need to be, make sure that that's not an issue. OK, any questions about that? Um, um, uh, uh, I was I was wondering about, about uh, recording in, interviews with or workshops or just, uh, just general video and audio recording with permission. Uh, would yep. that's also you and a uh, yes, but very much the with permission part. Um, some people just won't give you permission. Um, and some people will be quite happy. It just depends, but it can be really helpful, of course, because apart from anything else, the notes that you take, sometimes you're going so fast, the notes aren't that great, and it's good to be able to go back and understand what was going on. And um, last week when you guys interviewed some of the staff, I noticed that some of you were taking notes, and I could tell from the pauses that some of you were pausing answers asking the question because you were taking notes. If you could go back and, and listen to that again, it would make the, the process a lot easier. So yes, definitely an option, but very much only with permission. Any other questions? OK, I, I've definitely spoken too much, so will we take a quick break and I'll see you back in five.
Okay, that was a quick break. I wanted to make sure we finished off uh, the last bit. Not quite as long this time, so this is the other side of the coin. We've spoken about qualitative investigations where you're talking to people and getting your opinion. I want to talk about quantitative investigations. So here what you're doing is getting quantifiable data. Actual verifiable, this number is correct type data. How many invoices, how many shipments? What's the time period that's on? Okay, things that you can say, yeah. This is a number and we know whether it's getting better or worse or going up or going down or whatever. So, one way of getting it, you can always tell when PowerPoint's not working because my way of speaking changes and I will suddenly stop and pause as it won't move on in the presentation. First one is questionnaires or surveys. So you will send out things asking about particular issues. Um, how many times a week do you use the staff canteen? How many days a week do you drive to work? It's really helpful if you want to get uh, an idea of what everyone thinks. I've said before you're having to select people for interviews and workshops. You can't do everybody in any reasonable sized organisation, but you can get everybody to fill out a survey. So you'll get a, a better feel for everybody. Now, you need to be careful how you construct them clearly, because you could still have a, a survey that's qualitative. Don't be confused about assigning a number to a feeling. You can say how, uh, how much do you enjoy doing your job? Answer between one and ten. And you might be able to say, oh, well, on average, people enjoy this job 7.23 out of 10. Well, fantastic, that doesn't really tell you anything. What are their criteria for deciding what they enjoy? That's where the qualitative bit comes in. So, you can get a full input it helps if people aren't all in the same place. So if you've got a really big organisation where you've got multiple sites or an organisation where people work shifts and not all in all day, anything like that, it really helps to be able to get access to them. But you need to be really careful in terms of how you set up the questionnaire and the, the rules are on the, the screen just now. Make sure your questions are clear. You won't be there to explain them. So you need to make sure that they can take out exactly what they need from uh, the document that you've sent them. And when you send them that document, if it's 28 pages with 18 questions per page, they're going to look at it and go, are you kidding me? And you'll never get any of them back. So be clear about what you want to ask about and don't just ask every possible question that you can think of you need to have some sort of um, realistic goal. Be smart in how you design them. So think about who you're sending them to. Think about the sorts of stuff that they do. Um, there's no point sending the same questions to different sets of people who will have widely differing um, answers. UWS has campuses in Paisley and London. Asking somebody how often they're late for work because ScotRail have had a delay 
doesn't make much sense in the London campus. OK, so think about how you're designing these questionnaires. And as I said, people will immediately throw out anything that's too long, and actually some people will just throw them out anyway. So be realistic about your response rates. You can get them mandated, you know, you can get the you can get management to say, oh, you must return this. If you don't return this, you will get a disciplinary against you. It's not usually a good approach. So make it that people want to answer. Give them things that they want to talk about. But don't be shocked if they don't reply to everything. And one of the reasons you don't ask too much to begin with is because you might have to follow it up. So you might have multiple questionnaires where the follow up ones will depend on the answers you get from the first one. And you should be planning for that to begin with. What happens if I get this answer from this question as opposed to that answer? What will that mean to the project and what will it mean to what I need to find out later on? And as with the interviews, as with the workshops, understand what your questions actually are. Are they open questions? Are they closed questions? Are they on a scale? Are they multiple choice? What actually is it you're doing? And make sure that those questions will elicit a response that gives you information not just data, and there is a difference. OK, anybody, any questions about questionnaires? OK, next one is sampling. But instead of sending out a questionnaire to people and saying fill this out, you turn up with a clipboard and you observe. Which means that um, you don't have to hope that people return the, the questionnaire and also that you don't have to hope that they answer them correctly. Either deliberately or not. So you can decide what sort of activity you want to understand better. Um, and then you can just, as I say, go stand there with a clipboard. Now, not a good idea to turn up to somebody's workplace with a clipboard and stare at them. Make sure people understand what's going on. Make sure you've consulted with everybody you need to consult with. The people, management, the unions, anybody else that you can think of and make sure people understand that you're not judging them, that you're not uh, there to upset them, you're just getting some information. When you do it's important, so as with the atypical day thing with the shadowing, if you have an atypical day when you observe, you'll get atypical data. Make sure if you want to observe what's happening in a restaurant, well, you may want to be there at one o'clock on a Monday afternoon until five o'clock. But don't be surprised if you get very different answers to 6 to 11 on a Friday evening. So understand what's going on and choose your times. And time is important. How long are you going to do this? What's necessary to understand what's going on? How long do you need to be there? And how often are you going to check? If you are checking how many customers come in or how many plates are served or how many plates of spaghetti are cooked, is it per hour, per minute? What happens? So you need to be sure about all these things before you start, and then you can start to create uh, logging sheets to do that. So if you are going to investigate whether the road outside your house 
is getting busier. You could say, right, I am going to observe at different periods through the day. I'm going to observe for 10 minutes uh, on the hour from 7 in the morning to 7 at night. Well, this one is actually for 24 hours. I've done it all day. So time period one is 7 o'clock in the morning till 7.10 in the morning. And you've subdivided it. How many cars, how many minivans, how many SUVs, how many pickups? So you think about what it is you're observing. Think about how often you're observing and for how long before you start doing that. And you might want to combine it. So that's for one day. And that's fine, but will you get different answers on different days? If it's no, if it's amount of traffic, then the amount of traffic at eight o'clock on a weekday will be very different to eight o'clock on a weekend. Conversely, lunchtime on a Saturday will be very different to lunchtime on a Wednesday. So you need to start to think about when you're going to do these surveys and how you're going to get an overall picture. I was involved in one of these recently and it was about parking. And they did the surveys. And their assumption was we'll make surveys during shop hours because it's in a shopping area. And what they concluded was they could do without as many parking spaces as there were. And for the period nine to five where they had sampled, that's true. What they had missed was actually in that area were also was also a community centre. And that community centre is buzzing. But it's not buzzing nine to five, it's buzzing five to ten. With all the community groups and judo groups and advanced driver groups and all the other community groups that go in there. And if you go anywhere near that place between six and ten o'clock at night, you cannot get a parking space and you'll have to sort of start there and, and drive out. Till you so the parking calms down to find somewhere and you'll be walking quite a bit back in. So their conclusion was we can cut down parking space, which was true on the time that they surveyed, but wasn't true all the time. So you need to make sure you get representative snapshots over different times and days. Make sure that what you're observing is a reasonable conclusion. Doing that can also let you extrapolate other data. And there's an example on the slide there. Here we're sampling um, people setting up new accounts. And you can look at those numbers in your own time. Trust me, they're right. But it means that you can get information that maybe didn't uh, exist before. The example here is uh, time to set up a new account. That's maybe just something that's happened. But now we know that that takes 12% of somebody's time. Is that reasonable? Is it not? I don't know. But until you know that it takes 12% of somebody's time, there's no way of asking that question. There's a question in the chat about whether you should do it over the week or many weeks. And the answer is, of course, Yes, because it depends. And that's where your experience kicks in and your understanding of the problem and the understanding of these issues. So the answer to how long should you do this is the time that it takes to get the answer. So I can't say you need to do it for. What I can say is you look at the issue and figure it out from there. Any other questions about that one?
Okay, so we have observed people, we have asked them questions. The other place we can go for quantitative data are the records that already exist, and all businesses will have records. Receipts, um, orders, invoices, delivery notes, whatever it happens to be. So we can use those existing records and take that data to try and better understand things. Now, it's not always great. Uh, we're looking at hotel, the records for orders in the restaurant is on wee bits of paper that's on the waiter's pad and is scribbled on and is then shoved onto a spike above the cook and then usually binned as soon as it's done. So that doesn't tell you whether or not people are getting one course, two course, three courses, how long it takes, how much they're spending, all that kind of stuff. So sometimes you might want to think about what the records are and how you extract decent data for them. Sometimes you can't, so you need to create other forms and that actually brings us back to observing. If one of the things you want to understand is that, you create another form to say, okay, let's figure this out. How many people are coming in? How long does it take them to get their first course? How long does it take them to get their main course? How long does it take them to get their dessert? How long does it take them to get their bill? So you can either use the records that exist. We received three uh, orders. We have who they came from, the amount. We know how long it took because we can take that away from the delivery note. And so we know how long it took us to deliver an order and all that kind of stuff. So some may be okay, some might not be. Some you might have to create special sheets to try and understand what's going on for the things that you want to observe. This comes from the book, uh, one of the, the books, an earlier version of the business analysis techniques where there were 72 essential techniques, they've gone up to 99 essential techniques now. So you may want to do specific sheets to understand what's going on, depending on the problem. All the forms that exist, you can start to analyse them. Now I'm saying forms, but of course, form brings to mind a bit of paper. It may be a bit of paper, but it could be something on a screen. It could be in a manual, it could be in a report, it could be physical, it could be electronic, it could be anything. And it could be a combination of all of those. But what you want to do is analyse those forms. What is it they take? If someone goes to book a hotel room, what information is required? What information do they take? Because apart from anything else, what you're going to have to do, because remember you're a business systems analyst, you have to go from business to the systems analysis side. One of the things you're going to have to do is make sure that any data that they collect manually, for example, is also collected electronically. So you might want to do something like this and start analysing the manual documents that they have trying to understand the information that's in there. Here's a training record sheet and it says what it is, how many pages there are, whether it's typewritten, computer printed, handwritten, what size it is, how it's stored, who, who fills it out, how many there are, and all these other things. And as we get down towards the bottom, you can see that we're starting to move away from the business side because the business just knows it's a name. But if we are going to set up an electronic system, we've said that the name is alphanumeric. It has a first and a surname that has a maximum of 25 characters. That there's a payroll number that's numeric. And there's a range that we're allowed to have that there are dates. So 
So you can see how we start getting from a paper system to an electronic system, which again, if you think back to right at the start, that's what we're talking about in terms of a business systems analyst. So we can understand the business, but then translate that for the technical side. So you can start analysing these documents and these will then become a core part of the design for the new system. Any questions? No, no questions. All happy? Two thumbs up, even better. OK, if there's no questions, let me stop the recording. And as I say, this will be online as soon as I can.